That the recording has started? Yes. It's not me. Do you want some water? Or anything? No? Okay, no. you're good. Yeah. All right, feeling good? You yeah. do know that I make something up whenever yeah. I introduce you. Okay. I can, this is the only reason I'm doing this. this is okay, I got cool. So. You want to know your, your future. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. What your life path will be. It's like a fortune. Did you choose all the yeah. and read those? Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's listen just to get started. Hello and welcome to another Papers We Love. Uh, so we're at Wakia today. Thank you, Wakia, for letting us use your space and providing lovely wine, mostly, and also pizza and beer. Yeah. <laughs> we're a fan of the rosé. Yeah. Yeah, like we it. love rosé. OK, so to, like, should we start? All right, so this is the second meetup of the year. Welcome, everybody. Uh, some of you I know. Who's new? Awesome. All right, so I just want to maybe like remind everybody that we have a Slack channel where we like hang out and then um, I just pretty much chase you around and ask you to be a speaker. So know that that is a possibility. I think it's papers who love that herocoop.com or some sort of things like that. But if you say like papers who love Slack or something, you'll find it very quickly because the uh, like LA team has done that. So uh, we're going to start. We have like two speakers today. Marius is one of them, and he's the first one. And then with tradition, normally I present the bio of the speaker, and I add something fake to it. So let's get started. Marius is the CTO at, at Tubi TV, the world's largest free streaming TV and movie libraries. Uh, his interests include the simplifying complex systems, storage, and low latency network I.O. at scale. A transplant from Cyprus, he spends his free time trying to create the, all, the perfect all-American burger and also launches in, launching his line of hipster sweaters for kittens. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, yes, kittens are really are, are cool. So let's give it up for Marios. <laughs> All right, um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about um, a paper I read. It's called um, Throttling Utilities in the IBM DB2 Universal Database Server. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, and it's a paper that inspired my interest in control theory, which is a class I got a D minus in college. And uh, this wasn't. This started as a hobby, like an academic interest, uh, years ago. But uh, I ended up actually using some of the things I'm going to show you today um, in a production system that you are all um, have used at some point in your life. And um, it rhymes with mail uh, and hot mail. Uh, and that could actually may still be in production today. I don't know, because I left Microsoft years ago. So. Uh, let's start with a kind of a brief introduction of things I'm sure um, a lot of you already know. And I'm just going to move a bunch of this thing so I can move around. Um, so we have our typical system that is at most times trying to process two different types of things. One is user requests, and the other is background jobs. So the typical system could be a one machine trying to do all these things, or it could be a distributed system. That abstraction is irrelevant, but we for the most part, we can separate things into two things. So user requests, you know, they have a, a latency requirements. The user's waiting on the other end. You've got to get them their data fast. You can't just be chill about it. They need their data. Otherwise, they're going to leave. You're going to lose your customers, your money, your funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, those user requests could have CPU or I.O. requirements uh, that must be met. And um, they must produce consistent performance. I'm sure a lot of you uh, at some point you know, got into debates with people using the average response time. And you know, like, OK, that, that's just a useless metric. Like, we always look at the 99th percentile, or 99.9, .9 if we're that hardcore, because consistency 
when it comes to uh, user responsiveness, sometimes even matters more than the actual speed. And, um, you know, user behavior can be unpredictable. So all these things need to exist and happen despite changing user behavior. So for example, um, when I was at Hotmail, one of the things we um, did, we assumed that people would wake up early in the morning, Eastern time, check their mail, and they would send some mail towards the end of the day, so um, end of the business day. And uh, we kind of built our I.O. patterns around that. And there were a lot of hard-coded assumptions around that. And then we opened a data center in Japan. And it just so, for some reason, I still don't know to this day, uh, Japanese users use their email as an SMS service. So they're like all these thousands of little emails, tiny little emails throughout the entire day, just messing up with all our underlying assumptions. So, you know, when we're satisfying user requests, we, we gotta be able to adapt quickly. On the other hand, you have things, um, oh, and the one thing is, you know, when we do this, we usually benchmark on a clean system. So we set up some staging machines and we just blast them with requests to see how the system behaves. On the other hand, we have background processing, stuff that needs to happen, but it can wait. So an example of that is, and the one that the authors early 2000s were motivated by was backups. So they needed to back up this database server, but you know, the backup could wait if there was a user query that needed to happen. It's still, you still need to back up, but it didn't have to happen right now. Or data processing, your Spark, Hadoop, big data, whatever, jobs. Um, or the JVM garbage collector, like those, those pauses, like it doesn't have to be an IO system. They, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of work going to make sure that when the garbage collector runs, uh, it, it needs to run eventually, but if there's more important things to happen, it should wait. And somehow, it, after all these years, it still gets it wrong. And, uh, you know, other things like pre periodic cron jobs, uh, welcome emails, for example. You don't need to send a welcome email right now. You can send it in 10 minutes. You can send it in 20 minutes if your system is busy. Now, trying to solve this problem, uh, one of the first things that we did is just run background jobs at night. So you're saying, you know, after midnight, load is low, run all the background jobs then. So, but, you know, it, you move internationally, that assumption goes away. Uh, your jobs get bigger, so they start to spill over in the morning when, you know, East Coast wakes up. That just doesn't work. So, you know, you go from a simple solution and then obviously um, then you go to like, okay, I'm just going to have my background jobs run slower. So some engineer at some point hard codes a constant, some sleep time between things and defines a batch size that, I mean, six months later, even they don't know why they picked the number. And, or you change your hardware and your hardware's faster, so now that number is just irrelevant at this point. And then obviously after this, the next most obvious step is to over-engineer the thing. So now you have an XML config or a YAML or whatever, depending on what kind of shop you're running with different configs. That, you know, the idea is that there's someone's gonna be a non-engineer is going to be tuning these knobs after careful experimentation. That just, obviously, we all know how that ends up. And then the fourth solution that usually happens is a, what I call a poor man's controller, where you're, the metric that you care about, whether you're CPU or I.O. intensive, um, you monitor that and then you just adjust on that based on some equation you pulled out of thin air. So you basically take a metric, multiply it by some constant, add something to it, and it kind of works on your laptop, so you push it to a thousand servers and <laughs> see what happens. And usually what happens is, because this is essentially what a controller is. This is what control theory in a way is. What happens is you get these huge sinusoidal patterns where your system is reacting very quickly to a spike in the CPU, let's say, you know, slows down to a crawl, then jumps up to a spike. So you have this massive pattern that is just driving your system insane. And your average metrics, of course, um, all look great. <laughs> Don't use the average. Now, one of the things this paper did is, is simplify the goal, like to something we can understand. So they define what is it that we want to see in this, how would an administrator think of the system 
uh, and not fixate on the actual metrics or the solution. And this is straight from the paper. Uh, there should be no more than an X percent performance degradation of production work as a result of executing administrative utilities. So if you think about it, you're saying, okay, I'm going to provision my system with some, you know, 30 percent over capacity, and I'm going to say from baseline performance, let's assume we knew what baseline performance was, you can degrade from that about 20 percent and no more. Like you, if you have that 20 percent available background job, go ahead, use it, do your thing, make progress, but no more. If you find yourself going more than 20 percent, chill. So let's see kind of how, and I'm going to run things through how the paper has them and some of these concepts, it's going to get confusing at some point, but I'm just going to tie everything back together at the end. So the first thing they did is define how they're going to throttle. And, um, you know, they reason why this is the case, but they're just going to use the, the sleep time uh, threat, may put the threat to sleep as a way to throttle. And that may not make sense in a distributed system or somewhere else, but it's really relevant. All you need is a throttling mechanism. And the magic line is the second line, throttle equals get throttling level, which returns your number between zero to one, or zero to 100 if you want, but let's say zero to one. And we're gonna to get to how that magic happens. And for this system to work, you gotta break your work into small chunks. And you can break them into small chunks of units, the authors chose to use time, and they say choose times of like one minute or three minutes or five minutes. But th this part is critical, that it's got to be small chunks. It doesn't really matter the exact numbers, just pick something and stick with it. So they say like, you know, you can choose cycle time of five minutes, and the idea is your function, get throttling level, is going to return your number that's going to define how much you sleep and how much work you do in those five minutes. Then the other thing they did is impact estimator. So we talked about degradation from baseline and, um, and what that means. And that's very simply, degradation is one minus the current performance divided by baseline. And what current performance and baseline means to you or to the others doesn't really matter. You just pick a scalar metric and stick with it. For example, when I was at Hotmail, we cared deeply about disk I.O. That was our big thing. Like C CPUs didn't matter. It was all about disk I.O. So we're looking at, and it was like spinning, rotating disks at the time. So we're looking at uh, disk queue length. That was the metric most of the times. Few times we pick CPU. This system is like, doesn't matter. It's like a metric agnostic, but you just pick a scalar value and um, stick with it. Now, we talked about baseline performance, performance degradation. Uh, those things are, you know, they're nice abstract concepts, but how do you define them in something you can use? So the authors came up with this equation. Uh, y equals uh, the theta, as you Americans say, or theta, as we Greeks say, uh, theta zero minus theta one times one minus u. u is the number we got before. Remember that get throttling uh, level function? That's you. And if you look at that, if we go back, so remember that equation, which I should probably put, if uh, get throttling level returns one over there, then y um, is equal to theta zero minus zero. So it's equal to theta zero. And if u is equal to zero, then theta zero, then y equals theta zero minus theta one. So essentially, this is a very simplification of your world, of your system, where theta zero is your baseline and theta one is the degradation impacted by your utility. So if you didn't have the one minus u, you can think of it of theta zero is capturing your, your baseline performance if the utility didn't exist, theta one is what's impacted by utility, and one minus u is what's used to kind of tone down that theta one factor. Okay, now, how do we calculate that theta zero and theta one? So the authors, like a lot of academics, uh, say, oh, we just use online recursive least squares with exponential forgetting, uh, which, and they just really left it at that. <laughs> and back then, I don't know, Google wasn't the thing it was today. Um, 
that was kind of hard to dig out what that meant. Uh, but what it means after you go through a bunch of papers is really just a standard algorithm that does online regression. So we know regression, we, we have points on a plane and we feed a, a line through them. So all this does is do it in online way. So you don't need all the data points every time to kind of fit that line again. You just, every time you add a new point, you just run a, a very uh, easy, co computationally easy calculation with some matrices and you have your new line. So your kind of fitted line adjusts uh, online and the exponential for getting is to kind of slowly let older points uh, fade out in the background. So it's really nothing fancy. Hello? Okay, so it's really nothing fancy uh, and nothing to be scared of. You can look it up and uh, find a bunch of, you can, it might even be like some standard library for that today. Just talked about that. Now the actual controller part. Um, so how many of you here are actually familiar with control theory? Okay, a few hands up. So controllers are kind of the way I reason with controllers when I was, um, trying to understand the whole thing, it's trying to get the water in the shower the right temperature. So you start and it's really hot and then you're like, oh my God, it's so hot. And you go back and it's, oh, and now it's so cold. And you just keep doing this motion until you find the right temperature. And you know, some of you might be old enough to remember when you turn on a fluorescent light and it will flicker um, before it reaches steady state, that actually has a controller that it puts in current or something and then it measures and sees what it does and it's trying to adjust to get the light to be at a steady state as to stop flickering. So there's all sorts of different controllers, self-driving cars, they're like a big ass fancy controller essentially that's trying to steer you in the right direction. Now for this the authors of the paper choose what is called a PID controller, proportional integral derivative controller. They drop the D part which is the derivative and they kept the PI part. So P proportional is the first part, uh, KP times E, your error, and that's the world, the error right now in the world. And the second part is the integral part, which is just the sum of the past errors. And that part kind of tells you, um, helps you um, adjust in the face of fluctuations. Because if you only had the first part, you will go back to that whole sinusoidal thing. Like it would be very hard for you to reach steady state. The second part kind of helps us uh, deal with things that happened in the past and, and know about them. Now, uh, again, the authors of the paper uh, very casually said that, oh, we just chose fixed values for uh, KP and KI, which are the tuning parameters. Uh, I'm just gonna do a brief thing at the end how we get those, but before we get there, uh, are there any questions up to this point? They're, con they're tuning parameters. They're tuning parameters for the controller. Yeah. We pick constants for KP and KI, right? But the error, we don't know what the error is yet. So the error is our degradation from baseline. And what's baseline is theta zero. And what's our degradation, what's our, what are our utilities impacting is theta one. So basically we compute that um, y equals theta, uh, theta zero minus theta one, that equation constantly. So we measure our, the world as it is now, our metric, this Q. We know the value of u that we put in the system that our uh, thing return. We get back, using our exponential recursive squares thingy, we get values for theta zero and theta one. And then we use that to calculate the error. And the error is what degradation actually is minus what we want it to be. So for example, if degradation is 30% or 0.3 and we want it 20%, then our error is 0.1. Or if degradation is 10% and we want it to be 20%, then it's minus 0.1. So we basically keep trying to adjust our degradation until it hits zero. Cause we don't want to throttle too much. We want to make progress, uh, but we don't want to use up more than the 20% that we're allotted. Do you have a question?
Um, I think they're simple and well understood. Um, could probably pick a fancier controller. I don't know that much about control theory myself. It's not my day job. Uh, you could start getting, I, I think it was like maximum ROI in terms of it gets the job done while still being simple. Because uh, things can get complicated quickly. Yeah. Why they won? Uh, the derivative is something that helps you predict the future. So if you look at it, it's kind of like a, if you graph this, it's sort of a tangent uh, on some curve in some frequency space or something. Um, and it just, I think it's one of those things that is kind of complicated to get right because it has its own tuning parameter, uh, which needs to be tuned. So I think they just dropped it as unnecessary. So. I'm going to just go back and kind of put it all together again. Um, so we pick a scalar metric to measure. And then we um, have our equation there and we plug the numbers that we got. So at this point, uh, we use our recursive least squares to compute new values for theta 0 and theta 1, compute the degradation. And the error is the ek number is where we are versus where we want to be in terms of degradation. And then we just keep doing the same thing again and again and again. So as we keep doing this, we get new values of u, we plug them back in, we calculate new values of theta 0, theta 1, which again gives us new values of u, and we just keep going like that. And at some point, we reach steady state, which is when we are kind of hitting 20%. And then if there's an interference in the system, like Japanese users, uh, then, you know, the system will kind of get upset, but then it will reach steady state again. So it will start computing new values for theta 0 and theta 1. Now, this um, wasn't in the paper, uh, but, you know, I, I don't want to be an academic. So the values for kp and ki, the, the tuning constants, so you can figure them out, do this offline, do a bunch of math and figure those constants out, but that, that's, that, that's not cool. Uh, it also, it's, you have to keep doing that again every time your uh, underlying system characteristics change. Um, there's two ways that I know of to do this. One is called gain scheduler, which is an electrical engineer's uh, switch statement. It's basically, it's literally, it's like a big switch statement. Um, and, you know, if this parameter is choose this model, if this parameter is choose this model, uh, and that's also not cool. And the other one is a self-tuning controller where you use the same ideas with their recursive least squares to calculate some other model parameters um, that give you your constants kp and ki. So kp and ki you can express as a linear equation in terms of what characteristics you want your controller to have. For example, how long to reach steady state, meaning how long before this thing can settle. So for example, at Hotmail we had, you know, you can spend 20 minutes of erratic behavior is fine, you have 20 minutes, so that was our settling time, 20 minutes, or how much you can um, overshoot, how much you're allowed to overshoot. So you define those characteristics, uh, you plug them in some standard equations, it's called pole design, but again, standard equations, and um, very similar way, you can have those constants compute themselves uh, periodically without you doing anything. So that's kind of all I had, and Thank you for listening. And questions? Uh, so in the case that you did at Hotmail, uh, you said that disk was what you used for the, the coefficient, but what was the actual thing that you were throttling? Like, was it yeah, well, what was like the the resource or whatever that you were like, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, so we're throwing a bunch of things actually. We had uh, jobs that were garbage. So actually, you know, when you delete an email, it doesn't actually get deleted. Like we would delete them as a background job uh, just to batch the IOs together. Uh, it was like a bunch of things like that and they all use the same mechanism. Like they all picked from the same throttle, they all ran inside the same framework that provided this throttling service. So they all kind of throttle themselves off this one variable u. 
and every time another utility will kick in at the same time as everything else, um, you would see the characteristics of the system change and then it would take about 20 minutes to adjust again. Uh, so we used it across the board and the cool part is it also allowed us to do things we couldn't do before. Um, so for example, one of the things we did is have a process that would go in the background and touch random files uh, to check for bit rot on disks. So we weren't able to do that before because how do you even do that before if you don't have a way to run like at super idle times, um, like reliably. Uh, so yeah, it's a ton of different things. Is there another question somewhere? Yeah? The Spark stream. Okay. I was there first. <laughs> I did it before it was cool. That you're hiring. Oh, yeah, we are hiring. <laughs> yeah. Add password permission. No, it was okay. So, if anybody needs to use the restroom, is they're that way. Uh, and then, while Matt's like sets up, uh, if you want more pizza or more drinks, you can go to the back, and then we have three minutes till we kick off. So, you have three minutes. Three. You had four fingers there. And you said three, and then you did it. Okay, good. I thought you were trying to trick me there. Is that three? He was trying to get an extra. Yeah. yeah. Virus scan takes a whistle and plays. <laughs> 
All right. It's been more than two minutes. Well, actually, we said three, right? So, yeah. Let's go take our seats. All right. I'm going to introduce Matt. So this is Matt's bio. Matt builds tools and, tools and infrastructure for quantitative research at Two Sigma. He previously worked at Microsoft on Visio, focusing on the ways to connect data to shapes. In his spare time, he trains Arabian horses, runs the number one Michael Fassbender fan site, and builds ergonomic keyboards using Clojure. Also, it's like kind of hilarious how I always fuck up the ones that are lies. But, but yeah, so hopefully you're a Michael Fassbender fan. Sure. It was a little Magneto, <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Adareth, and I, I do build keyboards. I'm not going to talk about keyboards. People are sick of hearing about keyboards. Um, but I'm going to talk about this paper that I love called A Scalable Bootstrap for Massive Data. Uh, by Kleiner, Talwalker, Sarkar, and Jordan of the Berkeley AMP Lab, which you may have heard of. They made a bunch of things, including Mesos and Spark, which is um, formerly known as the new hotness. It's just the hotness now. Um, and uh, in addition to building systems, they've also developed a lot of interesting distributed algorithms to run on those systems. And this paper introduced one of those called the Bag of Little Bootstraps, which is a really adorable name for an algorithm, and it's another reason that I love this paper. Um, just a little bit about myself. I work at Two Sigma Investments on tools and infrastructure and methodology for quantitative research, and it's at the intersection of computer science and math, so I really like it, cause, and it's also another reason that I like this paper, because it's also at that intersection. Uh, we love papers we love. We sponsor the one in New York, and we're hiring. It's the end of my pitch. <laughs> Um, all right, so on to the paper. So who here has heard of the bootstrap method? All right, very few people, good. Um, I assume nobody does. So we're gonna like walk through the history of the problem that it tries to solve and, and the evolution of solutions to that problem, building up to the bootstrap and then to the bag of little bootstraps. Um, who here knows what massive data is? It, it's big data. Um, so, all right. Uh, bootstrap is just like used as a term in like everything. In computers, there are like a dozen different things that are called bootstrapping, and in machine learning and statistics, there are at least two. Um, it comes from this story that has nothing to do with bootstraps. Uh, Baron, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen. He was trapped in a swamp, and he couldn't figure out how to get out. Um, and he had a. Po he, he then realized that he could lift himself out of the swamp by pulling on his ponytail. Um, that's the whole story, and somehow that's been mutated into being him pulling up by his bootstraps. Nobody knows why, but it's just doing this ridiculous thing with what you've got and getting somewhere that you shouldn't be able to get, and, and that's, that's what this algorithm does. Um, so we'll see that. All right, so the problem. There's like this massive amount of data that we want to understand and we don't have access to. We only have like a small sampling of it. And we want to compute a statistic. We have this function that computes a statistic. And I'll talk about what that, some of the restrictions on that function. But really, it could be a lot of different kinds of functions. And our hope is that this function gives us a result that's a good estimate for what we would see if we had 
the ability to, to calculate it for the, the massive unknowable data. Um, and in all the stats papers, um, they call the, the true thing theta or theta. Um, and the estimate is theta hat. So whenever there's a hat on something, it just means that it's a guess based off of a sample. We see a lot of hats in these papers. All right, so usually we, we all do this. We all compute some statistics um, and we then, like maybe we compute the 99.9th percentile and then we tell that to people and we believe it, right? We, we say like, make a decision based off of this, but it's not quite right. Like we know that if we had gotten a different sample, we would have gotten a different result, right? And it would be great if we could like run the experiment multiple times with different samples and compute different theta hats. And instead of just saying one theta hat, if we could like show all the possible theta hats that you might get. Um, we don't do this uh, for a bunch of reasons, but we, we wish that we could. And, we, and maybe we could tell everybody all the theta hats that we get, but maybe it's, it's sufficient to just tell them some property of this distribution of theta hats. Like, like they, um, have this average or they have this standard deviation. Here's how spread out they are so that you can have some confidence in your estimate, right? So there's, there's gotta be a way to do this. Um, if you took a stats class, you probably forgot this, but there's this thing called the standard error of the mean. So there's, this is a way to compute the standard deviation of the means that you expect to get from just one sample. So what you do is you get the average, you sum them all up and divide by n, it's the average. Um, then you compute the standard deviation, and this is gonna be the most math that you see in, in this presentation, more or less. Um, so the standard deviation for each point in our data, we see how far away it is from the mean, square that so that they're all positive, divide by n to get the average, and then do the square root. Um, if you're fancy pants, you do one over n minus one. It doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> and that gives you the standard deviation, how spread out your data is. And then there's this magic that you can do because we're doing the mean and because we're doing the standard error of the mean, where you can say that the standard error, um, the, uh, the standard deviation of the means that you expect to get is actually estimated by just taking your standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of n. I'm not going to explain why. I don't know that I really could. Um, it has to do with the central limit theorem. It only applies to the mean. It only gives us a standard error. Like, this is great and very useful, um, but it only works for the mean. We have all these other statistics. Like, we, we just heard, don't use the mean, right? Like, there are other things that you want to compute. Um, so how can we get the standard error of those other things without having to do a lot of math? And that's what these techniques are all about. They're all about not doing math um, and using computers instead. All right, so I mentioned before that we, uh, question? The standard error is the standard deviation of your estimator. Um, yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, so there are a few requirements that we have on the function that we call a statistic. The first is that we want it to be consistent. Um, and they actually, it's actually weakly consistent. Um, they have weak and strong consistency in statistics also, and it means something totally different than in the distributed systems papers, um, of course. So the basic idea is the more data that we have that we feed into our function, the better our estimate should get. And if we had an infinite amount of data, we should just get our estimate. Um, so this is really about the the standard error of our estimate that it should be that the standard error should be shrinking as we as we have more and more data. The other is a little weird, and it's about this thing called bias. So statisticians talk about when statisticians talk about bias, they mean something different than what like normal people mean when they say bias. So usually when we talk about bias. Um, we think of what's called um, sampling bias. So like, let's say I wanted to estimate the average number of academic papers the, the average person has read. Um, and I just sample the people in this room, right? I'm gonna get an inflated value because this is papers we love. 
presumably I'll get an inflated value. Um, that's, that's sampling bias. Statisticians are concerned with a different kind of bias, and it's called estimator bias, and it's a little weird. So um, usually we deal with what are called unbiased estimators. So if I wanted to estimate the average um, height of people in the world, and let's say this was there was no sampling bias in the people in this room, there is, and we could talk about that at the bar, but um, let's say that this was a, a, a good sample of people, um, a uh, unbiased, un not, not sample biased uh, group of people. Um, if I take the average height, there's an equal likelihood that I'm too high as I'm too low, right? Like, there's no reason for me to be consistently high or consistently low. That's, that's what it means to be unbiased. Um, that our data is, that our results are gonna be centered around the true value. But let's say I wanted to estimate the tallest person in the world. Um, there are a lot of different ways that I could do that, but like one estimator would just be to take my sample and take the max of that sample and say that that's my guess. That's actually a consistent estimator. Like the more people I get, the closer that value is gonna get. It's gonna get arbitrarily close until I have all the people, like all seven billion people. But along the way, I'm gonna be wrong consistently because I can only be too low. I can't ever be too high. So this is a biased estimator. Um, and that's some sort of a problem. Like we know that it's wrong. So the salute the, the, these algorithms started trying to by trying to solve this problem of bias. So if you have a bi a biased estimator, is there a way to to figure out how wrong it might be and then to add that back in so that you can correct it and have a unbiased estimator? And the answer is yes. So it started um, in 1949 by with this statistician, uh, Kenui. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Afterwards, somebody can correct me. Um, so in 49, he published a paper where he had this idea, what if I take my data, my sample, and I split it into two, and to, to just break it into half and compute my statistic on each half. And what can I tell about the bias based off of the difference in the results there? And he had some promising results. And then in 56, he had this paper, Notes on Bias and Estimation, where he started playing around with, what if I break it up into smaller chunks? And um, one thing you could do would be to compute the statistic on each chunk. But that's not good, because then you're using a different number of samples in each, each time you compute the statistic. But what he did was he broke it up into chunks and then just left one chunk out and computed the statistic on the remaining chunks. And then left a different chunk out and computed the statistic on the remaining chunks. And did this a bunch of times and found that he could come up with a really good way of correcting for bias. And I'll, I'll get into some of the details. Um, and this was very promising. It worked really well for correcting for bias. And then a few years later, this guy shows up with his army of computers behind him. Does anybody know who this is? This is John Tukey. Um, this is the real reason why I wanted to give this presentation so that I could express my like nerd crush on John Tukey. Because he's a badass, or he, he passed away like 15 years ago. But he's a really important computer scientist and statistician. Um, and did a lot of amazing things, and I discovered that nobody knows him, um, or very few, not enough people know him. So he did things in computer science and statistics. In computer science, this is the guy who coined the term bit. Oh, whoa, <laughs> like that's 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 pretty pretty foundational. Um, he also invented the fast Fourier transform. Yeah, that's that's like one of the most important algorithms. Um, it's actually a cool story. It was part of the Manhattan Project. Um, they wanted to be able to detect if uh, other countries were testing nuclear weapons, and they had all these like seismic measurements from around the world that they were collecting. So it's like this Internet of Things kind of problem. Um, and so they had all this seismic data, and he realized that you could do a fast Fourier transform on it and detect like patterns and find out if other people were testing nuclear weapons. Um, it's just pretty awesome. So he did all this computer science stuff, fast forward, transform in bit. And then he did even more on the statistics side. He invented the box plot, which is cool. It was not invented by this other statistician named Box. It's, uh, um, 
and uh, like a bunch of a bunch of statistics, including the um, can we Tukey jackknife? Did I miss it? No. All right. So it's called the jackknife. Um, he named it after the Boy Scouts jackknife because it's a rough and ready instrument capable of being utilized in all contingencies and emergencies. So it the, it works on all sorts of different statistics without knowing anything about them, and it lets you discover um, these quality estimators like bias and standard error um, and like a whole bunch more for any statistic without having to do any like specific math for that statistic. And here's how it works. You compute your statistic for the data that you have. That's your theta hat. And then you just remove one piece of data and compute the statistic. And then you remove a different one instead. And you do this for all n of your data points. And you end up with n estimates. And you can treat these as different experiments that you had run. Um, you can treat this as the like space of theta hats. Maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe that makes you like un uneasy, um, but you can do it. And um, there's stuff that you can do to compute the bias. So you just average those all, subtract out your estimate from uh, the full set of data, and then multiply that by n minus one, and that tells you that's a good estimate for bias. Uh, in the in the case of trying to estimate the tallest person in the room, what this would translate to, what this reduces to, is you find the tallest person, then you find the second tallest person, and you find the difference between them, um, and you take that difference and multiply it by n minus 1 over n, so basically 1, um, and then you just add it to the tallest person. So it just gives you a slightly taller, a slightly higher number, um, and it works. It makes an unbiased estimator. And you want to, you will do that. You do that if you have no idea what the distribution is. Um, if you know what the distribution is, you might want to do something else. All right. So there were like a bunch for like a decade, just uh, or two decades. A lot of expansions on this idea, ways of making it better, correcting for other kinds of bias, um, and. It was just very rich. That's what a lot of computational statistics was working on. And then um, I'm calling out this one paper from 72, also from Bell Labs, by this guy, Yakel, or Jekyll, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, um, where he invented this thing called the infinitesimal jackknife. And this is noteworthy um, because it's, uh, sorry for being so, it's, it's kind of useless. Like nobody actually uses the infinitesimal jackknife. But what's interesting is how he thought about the problem, and some of the mathematical machinery that he invented became instrumental in the development of the bootstrap, which comes right after this. So what the infinitesimal jackknife does is it looks at the problem differently. So with the jackknife, we were looking at it as, like a, as a subset problem, where we have our data, and then we are going to do the statistic on some subset of it. And what Yackel does is he looks at it as a problem of weights. We have a vector of weights. Um, and in, when we're looking at all the data, it's just assigning the same 1 over n to all of the things. When we're dropping 1, we just assign 0 to that, and then the same uh, 1 over n minus 1 for all the rest, right? So 0 and all, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. When you look at it this way, it kind of opens up other possibilities besides looking at subsets. It lets you do things like double the weight that one thing gets, or look at fractional weights. And that's what the infinitesimal jackknife does. It actually looks at uh, um, what if you subtract epsilon from one of the weights, um, and then normalize the rest so that it all sums to one. And then look at how your statistic behaves as epsilon goes to zero, and that tells you some interesting things. This only works if your statistic has some nice properties that let you do calculus. Um, but looking at it this way was, was really important for what comes next, which is the bootstrap in 1979, in a paper published in 1979 called the 1977 Reitz Lecture. Um, Bootstrap Methods, another look at the jackknife by Brad Efron, who is 
an amazing statistician. Um, Tip Sharani is one of his grad students who is like the author of a bunch of books that machine learning people love. Um, he's a great statistician. He invented the bootstrap. So the bootstrap is an improvement on the jackknife. And what it does is instead of leaving one out, we create new samples from our original sample by sampling with what's called replacement. So we have our n values, um, and we want to create a new sample of n values. So we take one, and like we took d here, um, and then we put d back, and we, we leave it as an option for us to take again. So we create these sets of size n that are um, from our one set, but with resampling. So there's just going to be some re some things are going to be repeated, some things are going to be omitted. It's all random, um, and then you just compute your theta for each of these, and then use that as your population of potential theta hats. One thing that's really cool about the bootstrap, so it, it like converges better than the jackknife. Jackknife has all sorts of weaknesses um, against certain certain types of statistics. Um, bootstrap rocks those. Um, the cool thing is that you can do this as many times as you want. Like here I took three samples, but I could take 100 samples, or I could take 200, or I could just keep taking more and more samples, and the more samples I take, the better my results get. So this is really cool because it ties the accuracy of our estimates to the amount of, com just directly to the amount of compute that we're willing to throw at the problem. Um, empirically, like you do 50 to 200 samples, but you can do more. Um, there's just diminishing returns for doing that. So that's the bootstrap. Oh. So the, the all right, you're you're not a plant. Um, I, I had this one. No, I, I wasn't. I had this one slide that kind of gets to that, and I took it out because, in the interest of time, it's, it's at the end here after the questions thing, just in case. But it was actually supposed to be the last thing in the jackknife, so I'll just show it now. So, so like one example of where the jackknife fails is on the median. Um, so imagine that we sampled 11 values. Oh, repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was, like, why is the bootstrap better than the jackknife? Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, so the top here, I have x1 through x11. Imagine that those are in increasing order. Um, so I, got, I sampled 11 values, and I want to estimate the median. So the median here is, is x sub 6. Um, then when I start doing the jackknife, I don't get a good sampling of possible values for the median. I only can get three possible values for the median. I either get the original, if I, if, I, if I take out something from before the median, then I get the median averaged with the one above it. If I take out the median, I get its two neighbors averaged together. And if I take out something after the median, I get the median and something, the thing that was immediately before it. So I only get these three values. And there are some quality estimators that aren't going to do so well with this. Like, like you kind of, you kind of expect that there would be more possibilities for what the median might take take on. Like, you don't know. Um, and the problem with it is that no matter what n is, no matter how many samples I take, I'm only going to get three. Uh, whereas with the bootstrap, I can get a, a like wider variety of theta values, and that makes some of the statistics better. Yeah, I was glossing over the fact that the, the max has the same problem. Um, yeah, all right. So bootstrap, we did that. All right, uh, there's a gem in the paper where he talks about the other names that he thought of for the bootstrap. Um, the Swiss Army knife, the meat axe, um, and his personal favorite is the shotgun. Um, I'm not going to read that. Uh, I do kind of wish that we were talking about the bag of little meat axes, um, but it's bootstraps. All right. So, so yeah, Efron, it's got a sense of humor. It's good. You got to read the whole paper to get to this, though. Um, so, uh, bootstrapping is actually used, and this is kind of uh, appropriate given the the last talk. Um, there is this. 
great article in IBM Developer Works about robust Java benchmarking. It's this two-part thing where they address all of these issues with benchmarking uh, on the JVM. Like, how do you deal with the fact that there are going to be garbage collections? How do you deal with jitting? How do you deal with all of the other Java JVM garbage? Um, and they have all these great technical things about how to deal with those, but also a lot of great statistics that you should use when analyzing the results. And one of the things that they would recommend is using the bootstrap to get um, to get error bounds on on your measurements. So that's like an appeal to authority that this article exists, but I'm just going to double down on my appeal to authority because there are two other libraries. There's Criterion for Haskell, and there's Criterium for Clojure that both copy everything from this paper. Um, if the Haskell and Clojure folks can agree on something, that's a, that's like a miracle. So. Um, that's a sign that there's some, something here, and they're agreeing about something from the Java world. So, like, this is this is good stuff. You should use the bootstrap. Um, all right. So it's cool, but does it scale to big data? Um, and it sort of sort of does. Um, like, you you can you can run it. It's it's going to take some time. The problem is that for each of these resamplings that you do. Um, you need to touch all of your data because you need to do a sampling, which is going to touch all the data. Maybe it's being read from disk, and then you need to compute the statistic over all that data. And maybe that's maybe that's hard for you to do. I mean, your statistics probably map reducible, um, but you've got communication cost, and you're just touching the data over and over again. So it's kind of slow. Um, you can do it, but it's slow. So that's where the bag of little bootstraps comes in. And it was introduced by two different papers in 2012. There was the one that I linked to, which I later realized was like the very difficult mathy one. I apologize, I'll send a link to the other one. Um, that's, uh, I, think, I think, more accessible, hopefully more accessible after this talk. Um, one talks about scalable bootstrap for massive data. The other one's called the big data bootstrap. Uh, the big data bootstrap is the one that was accepted by a journal because it says big data. Um, <laughs> so it introduces this algorithm, which is the the reason that I'm I'm here. Um, I'm not going to expect you to read the law tech on the left. I'm just having it up there in case somebody wants to look at it later along with this picture that I made. So the way that it works is we've got our big data, our n values, nine. Um, in this case, but but like imagine that it's big. So big data to the, it means that it's so big that we need to store it across multiple machines and to compute anything on it, we need to compute it using multiple machines. Um, so we've got our n data spread across our machines. And then what we do is we pick a number b that's much smaller than n. And we sample b values from those n. And we do this without replacement. We, we don't want to have any duplicates in here. We, so we get B values. And we send those to a machine. And we, try to, we pick B small enough that B values can fit comfortably on a single machine, hopefully in memory. Um, and then on that one machine, we sample N from that B. So we sample nine values from the three values that we have. So obviously. They're going to be duplicates by the, the pigeonhole principle. Um, so we sample our n, and we compute our statistic on that. And then we do that a bunch more times. We do that r times. Make it like, yes, go ahead. Yes, that's a good, that's, that, is, that is a good observation, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Imagine that I have a, it's a machine of holding, okay? Um, <laughs> and it's, it's gonna work, okay? But great, great point, yes. Like, N is, N is big. Um, so temporary sp suspension of disbelief, um, we do that. And we compute the statistic for a bunch of different samples. Uh, then we do the whatever the aggregation is that, that was defined that we're interested in, like we compute the standard error or the bias. 
Um, and then in parallel, we pick a different B on a different machine, we do the same thing, um, and we do that S times. So let's say we have S machines. Uh, and then we just average the results from each of these. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I, I missed that one. Um, all right, so you had a, there was a, a great point that N is too big to fit on this machine, um, but we only have B values. So this is, so one trick, one, one great thing about the algorithm is that we're doing this stuff in parallel, so hopefully that's better, that makes things faster, we're able to dedicate more compute resources. Um, but there's this other trick, which it may be the, the more important trick, which is often the estimator that we're computing can work with a weighted data representation, and this is kind of a callback to the infinitesimal jackknife insight. Um, so like, let's say we're computing the mean, Normal, like one way of doing it is you just sum up all your values, your n values, and then you divide that by n. Um, but if you know that there are a lot of repeats, you can write it as a function of the unique values and their respective counts. Okay, so if it's a linear time algorithm, this takes it from on to ob. Um, if it's like a like a super linear thing, it's even better, right? Like we're we're just not doing computation left and right. Um, and it's much faster, and it's how we're able to fit it onto a single machine. And the cool thing that they mentioned in the paper is that like almost everything that they want to do can be done this way. So all the common statistics that we compute, um, like all the different regressions and support vector machines and, and like everything is just has a weighted representation. Um, so that is great. It, so we've got parallelization and we've got the fact that our samples have a lot more repeats than when we do the bootstrap. Um, but like should maybe, but there are gonna be repeats in the bootstrap also, maybe that could take advantage of this insight. Well, not quite. Um, you could do some math and show that the expected number of values in a bootstrap sample um, is 63.2% of the of the values that you're sampling from. So usually you're using like t almost two thirds of your data anyway. You you can get some benefit from it, but it's still gonna be O of N. Um, I'm not gonna walk through this right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. So the shocking thing is that this algorithm was designed to work in like on a distributed system, but it turns out that it's also awesome just on a single machine, and that you could just use this algorithm on a single machine and beat the bootstrap. So just use this instead of the bootstrap from now on. Um, so what you do is you pick B values on, on your single machine and do all that work just with those B values, save the result, then do another B values, and just do this S times, whatever S is. There are some recommendations in the paper. Um, so here, they were doing it on a classification problem with d just small 20,000 points, 10 dimensions. Um, and the legend here, can you, can you all see that? Um, is This is the bag of little bootstraps with B equal to the square root of N. Uh, this is, B equal to n to the 0.6 all the way to n to the 0.9. Uh, it, part of the proof uh, requires that B is at least the square root of n. Um, so that's one limitation. Usually that's not a problem. So the square root of n doesn't do so well. This is measuring how long it took. Um, I assume it was wall clock time. Um, when you use B as the square root of N, it doesn't converge quite as well as the bootstrap, but like all the other values actually converge faster than the bootstrap. And uh, in the paper, they recommend using 0.7, just based off of all of the empirical evidence that they've collected. So that's on the single machine. And then they had this other graph of how it works on a distributed system. So this is big data, uh, six million points, 3,000 dimensions for each point. Um, I, I didn't even think if this was big data. It's 150 gigs, um, and they want to load it in memory. And they're doing a logistic regression. 
So on the left is the performance uh, when it's being read from disk. So I'm, I'm not wasn't totally clear why they did it this way. If somebody figures it out, comment. Um, but they show the red dot is the performance that they got using bag of little bootstraps um, with uh, b equals n to the 0.7. So it's very fast and very low relative error. So the data was synthetically generated, so they knew the true value. They knew the ground truth. So that's what this relative error is relative to. Um, and then the bootstrap they were doing in a distributed fashion. So they were, do, they were computing their statistic like in a map reduce way, um, each for each generation or for each sampling, reading the data from disk. Uh, so it takes a long time and it doesn't converge nearly as quickly. And then the second one here is reading the data from memory. So they had all the mem all the data in memory. It's still it, it's it's much better than reading from disk, but the bag of little bootstraps still wins. And yay! All right. So, oh, question. They have some recommendations. Um, the, the question was, they have a recommendation for B, what do you do for S? And there's also a question of what do you do for R? How many of these Monte Carlo like resamplings do you do? Uh, the R1 was more interesting. The S1, um, I, I can't remember all the different concerns, but you could just do the number of machines that you have. Um, why not? So that was S. R, they do something interesting where there are some uh, um, adaptive techniques where you just keep doing it until your values converge. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a neat trick. And there are other papers about doing some, about detecting bootstrap convergence by uh, at least Ariel Kleiner, who is the first author on this paper. I, I don't remember if, who the other ones were on it. Um, a lot of that stuff is used in BlinkDB. Uh, if, you've, if you've heard of that, um, they were, th th these papers formed the foundation of BlinkDB. All right, so my closing thought. Um, Statistics, computer science in the middle, there's this computational statistics field. There are lots of cool papers in, in there. And there's, th these two fields have really like grown up together from the 50s and 60s, um, like as evidenced by Tukey. He's like, his ghost is floating in the middle there. Um, and what what's really interesting to me is that like this paper sits here, like at the intersection of statistics and distributed systems. And it's really cool because they didn't just take some math that already existed and think like, is it a CRDT? Can we map do this with MapReduce? Like, um, they, they really thought deeply about the algorithm and how it could be modified while still maintaining convert, like all the nice mathematical properties, but to take advantage of distributed systems. And then on top of that, just in the course of this, they just figured out something that's even better not on distributed systems, which is awesome. Uh, I suspect there's going to be more happening in this little space of the graph. This is not to scale. Um, <laughs> all right, so thanks to all these folks. Um, Inez and Elaine, thank you for organizing all of this. You guys are amazing. Um, I had several people help me with the presentation, and thanks, for, thanks to Wikia for hosting. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'm open to it. Um, prefer any, for if we could start with any questions that are about any points that were confusing before we move on to the questions that are comments. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this came out of AmpLab. Is there a Spark implementation of this stuff? Uh, yeah, and I believe a lot of the tests that they that they did, like those graphs, were um, based were were being run on Spark as like the platform that this all was implemented on. Uh, so the question was, is that part of MLlib? I'm not sure. Um, it wouldn't surprise me. It should be uh, Tallwalker, who's the second author on this is one of the lead de developers of 
uh, MLlib. And one thing that's like really st struck me as weird about MLlib is that a lot of the techniques that are there um, don't report um, things like confidence intervals or t-stats. Like, like even uh, last I looked, it was a while ago, but like for linear regressions, there were like some basic things that I would expect to be there that aren't there, and it's because it, they've implemented it in a way where they're not doing the like simple linear regression that everybody does. They built it on top of uh, like gradient descent, so you don't get all the all the things that you would get along the way of computing a linear regression. Reading, like learning about this makes me think that maybe that was intentional and that the plan is to just use the bootstrap or a bag of little bootstraps on all of those techniques um, to get error bounds and things like that. What's, what's cool is that uh, this can get you error bounds on weird machine learning techniques that where it's not obvious how to get it. Like um, that theta can be the parameters to a neural net, like the weights at all the edges and also including like the the layout of the network itself and you can do some some cool stuff uh so there was that trick that was used for um the ob trick um do they detail how it's used for you said they list the cases where it's not for simple things like the mean but do they detail how that happens for more practical things like svms so um, I believe most most of those things have weighted implementations. Like they, they just expect that your data will have different weights. So um, I, it's, a lot of that should just be available in the standard libraries for these things. Um, it, it would surprise me if it's not. OK. Um, so I, I wrote it in a, a little way that I was hoping would make it less confusing. Maybe it made it more confusing, and I apologize for that. So you could think of this as um, each of your observations has a weight. And um, this is a standard thing in a lot of like machine learning algorithms and like linear regressions. You do a weighted linear regression very often. Um, so I cheated here and said that we've got these counts and that at the end we divide by n. Instead, what we could do is say that these are weights, w1 through wn, and while we're summing up, we could also keep track of the total, the sum of the weights, and divide by that instead. Um, and a lot of these algorithms work that, like, like have implementations that do basically that. So, yeah, uh, does that answer the question? Okay, cool. That, that's a that's a great question. Um, so the question was, when you pick the B elements, do you have to pick from the full set of N, or can you pick locally? And that is, they, they mentioned that in the paper. Um, if your data is sharded in a way where you feel like picking from one shard isn't going to introduce sampling bias, then go for it. Just use the data that's already there. That's a totally natural thing to do. You can skip that step of sampling across the whole data. Yeah. But, but make sure that you're not introducing sampling bias. Um, um, you can. I would, I would go through each of them first, at least once, before revisiting one. Um, you could probably do it, treat it as like a mixture thing where you randomly pick which shard you're going to go to. Um, and then do that, and in, in that case, I'd feel comfortable if it randomly decided to revisit the same shard. I don't know if that answers your question. We could talk about it at the bar if it doesn't. <laughs> All right, um, I'll be at the bar if anybody has any questions. Uh, Local tap. Oh. Okay. One block that way. All right. Third and Brandon. All right. Cool.
Thank you.